All right, and welcome to another episode of I Love Black People. And we thank you so much for uh, joining us on this wonderful journey. And today we've been blessed with an amazing, dynamic, wonderful sister. And I, I say this because not just because she's a, a friend, not just because she I've seen her do so much for our people, but because literally she is a reflection of that love that we so often talk about spreading and sharing. And she does it in a way that impacts so many people uh, and I just want to thank you and welcome good sister Catherine Buell on this show. Help protect us from racism and xenophobia by becoming an I Love Black People ambassador today. Join on ilovebeblackpeople.com. No matter where you are in the world, join us today and get access to the I Love Black People Network. Special thanks to Banneker Communities. Thank welcome, you. Welcome, welcome, Catherine. Thank you, thank thank you, you for thank having you. me. Thank you. Know, you. Look, I, I always try to get the, the guests to go ahead and give a little background. Again, the, the love and the how wonderful you are. I could actually try, but I think you would do, <laughs> do yourself the most justice and kind of highlight, you know, how did you get here and some of the things that you've done in your background, you know, and I think it, it, it's helpful to our audience so they, they can kind of get a better understanding of your journey. That is awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It is such an honor to be on your show. Um, I have clearly been an admirer for quite some time. So um, it's really wonderful to see all of the great work that you're doing. And um, yes, my name is Catherine Buell, and I am the director for the Housing Equity Fund with Amazon. I have the pleasure of overseeing our more than $2 billion housing equity fund, where we're looking to create or preserve 20,000 affordable housing units in three of our hometown communities. That includes the Arlington, Virginia and DC region, Nashville, Tennessee, and of course, Puget Sound um, near Seattle. And I am um, here to tell you a little bit more about the Accelerator Program. But before I go into that, would love to tell you a little bit about my background. I am a native of Silver Spring, Maryland. I actually went to Spelman College and came back and went to law school here in the DMV at Georgetown and moved into Ward 8. I lived in historic Anacostia for a little over 10 years and got really active in community development. While I was an attorney by trade and practiced at a law firm, um, in my evenings, I became what I call is a nosy busybody <laughs> and started to go to many community meetings and really get active. I served on the and chaired the District's Historic Preservation Review Board, but then decided that I was going to jump into community development full time. I ran the St. Elizabeth's East Redevelopment when we were coming out of the master plan and we were building Gateway DC and the RISE Demonstration Center. We got a development partner, got the entertainment and sports arena off the ground, and that commitment in place. Went to Atlanta, ran the housing authority for some time, came back to DC, and now I'm with Amazon. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, come black, coming black. <laughs> love it, love it. I think that whole little like homegirl story was awesome. I like how you, you kind of put those pieces together. Um, I think, again, I, I know you got so much to talk about, but your story as a, a person who's been a professional in leveraging that which you've learned to give back to our community at such a high level, uh, you know, is not said enough that we, yeah. you don't have to be a politician. You don't have to be someone who's trying to be uh, connected, just somebody committed to our community. I think that's right. You've shown that by your example and your work. I mean, again, and people like you, you don't get your horn tooted because that's not how you go about it. But your body of work, this, this even listening to it uh, is, is, is inspirational. And I think, you know, as many of our listeners, be, be it might be some, some Howard students as well as Howard alum and, and our greater community that follows us, I just think it, it, it lets them know that it's important that we get back. We don't have to wait That's for right. politicians. We are the ones we're waiting on. We've That's done right. all this training and all this development. Give it black. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> and if we didn't say thank you enough, thank you already. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I love it. I will say, you know, Sinclair and I, for those who don't know, we crossed paths when I was being a curious, nosy, busy body, <laughs> probably yes. about 15 years ago. Yeah, and God bless you. Yeah. And really learned and appreciated the importance of being in the room, regardless of your background, regardless of whether or not you feel like you fit in. I will say when I served on the DC Historic Preservation Review Board, I was younger. I was different. I lived in a different part of the city than everybody else, but I was still welcome there um, and really, really learned the value of showing up, asking questions and giving back. 
And you were early. Look, you said historic <laughs> Anacostia. Sister, you was about that life. So God yes. bless you. I'm going to keep it like I'm going to keep it real regular. But I know you came to tell us about some yes. of the wonderful and shout things. shout out to Ward 8. <laughs> shout out to Ward 8. Like, not in a literal sense, but a shout out in the yes. first, most figurative sense. God bless you. Yes, yes. Southeast love. So love. All right. What you got? What you got? Good so sister. I am here to talk about our more than $21 million commitment to creating a pilot accelerator program through the Housing Equity Fund. When we launched the Housing Equity Fund, we not only committed to creating or preserving those 20,000 affordable housing units, but doing it in a way that's equitable and inclusive. And we noticed early on that while in certain jurisdictions, there are minority development partners that we could work with, there wasn't quite the scale um, in the bench that we really wanted to see. And we're serious about making sure that we're working with diverse partners, not just making affordable housing available that will directly benefit communities of color, but really being mindful of who we're working through to create those units. So this week, we announced our $21 million accelerator program, which includes a program through Capital Impact Partners. Capital Impact Partners is located here in HQ2. They have been a longstanding um, African-American run community development financial institution. They've done a lot of great work. They actually have an equitable development initiative to train emerging real estate developers and how to advance their real estate development projects and agree to modify that program specifically for emerging affordable housing developers, provide mentorship, training, and most importantly, access to capital. Through the Accelerator Program, we're looking to provide flexible um, dollars to minority developers who are looking to advance uh, affordable housing projects. So Capital Impact Partners will be um, accepting applications from interested partners, minority developers who already have affordable housing projects that they are looking to advance. Um, those fellows will be expected to go through a training and mentorship program, but we're looking for um, firms that we can partner with, not only to help with some of the pre-development expenses that firms have to carry for years before they can get a shovel in, ground, in the ground, but also potentially financing their deals through the Housing Equity Fund um, and really expanding the list and um, partners that we have to be able to, again, create those 20,000 affordable housing units. I think that's amazing. How can uh, these uh, developers, uh, aspiring developers, as well as I, I'm sure there's a host of contractors and and there might be even folks. I think you know you're making me think about how some folks may start in one space, maybe construction management, and might want to get into development. How do you see this program being able to connect with some of those folks? Yeah. So first and foremost, I encourage anybody who is interested in learning about the program to go to Capital Impact Partners website. It's capitalimpact.org um, and check out their information about their program. Um, we are the funding source, but we really are looking to our partners to help us identify those emerging, emerging minority developers who we can support. And we expect that they'll um, identify somewhere between 10 and 14 developers in the HQ2 region. Um, if you are interested, also making sure that you just ask them the right questions to understand whether or not the program is for you. We're looking for developers who have affordable housing projects that are in play. Um, and so this is really an opportunity to take the next two years to get all of the support that you need. And so the key is making sure that for partners who are interested, making sure that you're coming with the right platform so that you can really fully take advantage of our accelerator program. Wow. You know, and I, you know what? Another question that came to my mind, I mean, you know, just your choice and even uh, uh, allowing Amazon to be affiliated with your body of work, or I probably should say the fact that you picked Amazon, <laughs> you know, I, you know the, to see a tech company uh, engaged in this type of work, you know, can you give me some of that? Like just yeah. so that folks, when people think of Amazon, they, they think about all kinds of things. <laughs> yes. So I'm just going to say that with that being said, you, you know, being the face of what this is being done, you have your own brand. And when we think of you, we think of somebody who really cares and who's committed to us. So they're benefiting from that goodwill. What <laughs> made you take that goodwill that you have and, and work with and work for a company like Amazon? How, how do you see them as being important in this space? Yeah, 
honestly, um, I feel blessed and covered to be able to do this work every day. What I found, much to my surprise, is that the leadership at Amazon genuinely cares. Their community members, just like the rest of us, they want to see their communities thrive. They acknowledge that there is um, speculation and things that go on in the housing market that they don't control, um, but they're just as equally concerned. And Amazon has taken a number of efforts to invest in affordable housing including through matching programs from our employees. We also have a number of additional community investments that we make around the region um, from our Amazon and Future Engineers program to employee volunteers, um, to disaster relief and the like. We're really active, um, but we saw affordable housing as the next area for us to make a major investment. And essentially by being able to deploy such a large amount of money, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to support some models that are totally different. For me, being able to have that opportunity with leadership that is so committed to this issue is a dream. It's a community development partner stream to be able to have the kind of impact. And it, my job, the hardest part is not talking about all the work that we're looking to do in the capital region, um, but it really is going to make a difference for a lot of folks who um, have been struggling with how to advance affordable housing projects for some time, particularly in key areas. Near transit stations, we have a partnership with Metro where we've committed $125 million to developing affordable housing at Metro stations. We know that if we can reduce the cost of housing and we can reduce the cost of transportation, that we can maybe have a major impact on how families are able to move throughout the capital region and survive over the long term. The other thing that I've been so impressed with is just the power of Amazon's name. We've been able to not only get into partnerships like our partnership with Metro, but we've also been able to get to par get partners to commit to long-term affordability. So for our initial projects, we've been able to get our partners to commit to 99 years of affordability, which is really truly a long-term commitment that we're seeing people step up to the plate, do what they need to do to make sure that those affordable housing resources are quality, um, but that they're going to be in place for generations. And this is not just a flash in the pants. It really is an opportunity to see communities grow in a way that is more inclusive across incomes, across demographics, um, without having to um, fudge the numbers around short-term commitments. Yeah, you know, and you, and you talk about short term commitments and I know stockholders are looking for immediate returns. And even when you start talking about this long term vision, we normally uh, think of governments. But again, they get caught up in election cycles. How would you see the, the compare and contrast being in the private sector in your capacity with Amazon and some of the things that you've seen as far as large government uh, organizations trying to do similar work? Or yep. do you see there is a complementary? I mean, how, how do you see the difference? Because you've been at the tops of the tops in, in both of these spaces. <laughs> yeah. I, it's a good view from up there. What, 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 did you, what have you seen? Exactly. Well, I will say, one, we do know that housing is the government's responsibility, making sure that housing affordability is in place, governments control zoning laws and the like, they can have land that they can contribute to affordable housing. So we acknowledge um, that governments really are in the leading role on affordable housing. We actually have a position statement as a company on affordable housing, acknowledging the role of governments, but also acknowledging that housing affordability issues disproportionately affect people of color. And given the company's commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, we really see the Housing Equity Fund investments as a way to meaningfully support communities of color, whether it's through providing affordable housing or investing in programs like our accelerator program. This is our way of truly making a difference in an area where you wouldn't necessarily think a tech company would make a difference, but we're also we're able to be creative in ways that government maybe sometimes is restricted. We're also able to identify unique partnerships. So we don't always have to go to the Department of Housing <laughs> and make sure that we're applying for some of the Housing Production Trust Fund money um, or some of the loans that governments make available. We can actually put out money that is more flexible, that complements what governments have been doing for some time and adds to the pie. I like to say and think of my job as expanding the pie, not duplicating the pie, not replacing the pie, but really expanding the tools that we all have at our disposal to make sure that there is a level of affordability in this region that we all desire. Wow. 
With that being said, how about the other way? Uh, you know, there's other, you know, large companies, companies, more traditional companies that have been in the region, as well as, you know, other uh, Silicon Valley type players. How would you compare or contrast some of the other, uh, you know, industry leaders in the tech space and, and Amazon? How would you or do you see anyone yeah, else? Yeah, in, in no. This area? We, we do see, we see a, a number of our other tech peers going into the area of affordable housing and we're all taking our own different approach because of some of the local jurisdictions. So in our hometown of Puget Sound, Microsoft is making a huge investment in affordable housing. The good news is, is that we talk, we exchange notes, we, we look to ways that we can really improve and contribute to issues of affordability. Um, and we appreciate the fact that everybody has taken their own approach. So we're actually seeing more and more corporations willing to invest in this area. The question is just how to invest. Housing is very expensive, <laughs> no matter how you dissect it. Um, and so the numbers that you have to contribute to invest in affordable housing tend to be pretty significant. Um, I have been impressed with not only seeing my tech peers um, and other tech companies make investments in affordable housing, but even groups like Kaiser Permanente, we're seeing healthcare companies go into the space of affordable housing. We're seeing companies like JBG Smith invest in things like the Washington Housing Initiative. We're seeing more and more folks willing to step up because at the end of the day, housing affordability addresses affects all of us. What we're seeing in the capital region is that workers don't have the funding to really be able to live and thrive long term in the capital region. It's not only a the right thing to do, but it's a workforce issue. It's an economic development issue that could potentially constrain how this e region is able to grow by having so many different partners invest in whatever way they find appropriate. We really think that that's going to be the winning solution. Governments alone can't solve this problem. We've all got to play our part. Wow. It sounds like y'all playing a, a great part. I, I was trying to come up with something clever to say, but I, I'll just say great part. And that's, that's good enough. I'll take that <laughs> all day, every day. <laughs> Hopefully. Look, look, I can, I'm trying to be cool. I, I can't even, well, well, check this out. I think one of the other things that I, you know, and I'm sure you hear it with the, the rising cost of housing, as well as how the workforce is changing with remote work and how that might impact so we talk about yeah. serious serious issues like gentrification and and the inf impacts of that how do you see the future like you know it's it's difficult to plan no you're going to plan the praise God for that but with the world we see now what we're looking at now is literally not what it's going to look like later so i guess the question becomes what do you see and how do you see those things changing and what do you think is important for us to do to prepare for those changes? Oh my gosh, change is happening. And whether we acknowledge it or not, because we're all locked in our homes, some of us do have to go to work every day. We don't see all the changes that are happening. But for example, in the capital region alone, the Regional Council of Governments recently passed a resolution focusing on the 225 light rail stations in the capital region. There has been a ton of investment in light rail that includes improving and expanding capacity at the Long Bridge, which is just near HQ2, which will allow um, increased Amtrak um, capacity as well as potentially allowing Mark the Mark train from Baltimore to go to Richmond and the VRE wow. to go to Baltimore. So there's a lot of change that is happening around in the in the background that at some point we're all going to look up and realize the capital region is more connected than we ever thought possible. And because so many of those changes are happening in the background and policymakers have really been focusing on improving the transit access, that also creates an opportunity to create more equitable communities. So the Regional Council of Governments has been focused and passed a resolution this um, September focused on expanding the number of equitable communities around the capital region to connect those 225 light rail stations, um, not only to each other, but to making sure that there are plans to build affordable housing, to build amenities near those light rail stations, so that you don't necessarily have to live downtown DC to feel like as if you're part of the region, you're part of a thriving community, and you're part of an inclusive and equitable community. Because we're aware that those changes are happening, it just really re-emphasizes the need to make sure that we're 
we're contributing to housing affordability and planning for these things well in advance. Because so many of us, I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and you look up and you think, oh my gosh, this has changed. And it feels like it happened overnight. So we have an opportunity as much as possible to try to get ahead of those changes. So we actually contributed $500,000 to the Council of Governments to create subgrants to local jurisdictions, some of those off the beaten path who don't always think about equity or have the resources to focus on equity and affordable housing to do the planning now to try to figure out how do we make sure that we're building more equitable and inclusive communities as more and more assets suddenly become um, real connectors for us throughout the region. Wow. Now this, now this is, I'm, I'm going to get a little far out there and I'm, and, but I, and when I go too far, just, <laughs> just give me the high sign. Um, one of the issues is, you know, and I, I saw, and I think we're going to have this sister on as a guest. She works with Microsoft talking about uh, Vicky, Vicky Bird, but there's a, a um, issue of broadband and access and even looking at uh, the states and cities responsibility for making for like Wi-Fi available available for you know all public spaces and things like that, or yep. even the public housing. Have you seen any discussion or been part of any discussions like that, or is that something different? I, I you know that's that whole issue of being connected, not just the physical. When you started talking about that, it made me think about being connected via the internet too. Just you know, you know, it's interesting. The areas that we're investing in, the, the number one issue is not actually internet connectivity. It, it is more so what retail do we have? What amenities do we have? And when I say amenities, I mean things like childcare. <laughs> Can I actually maintain my current lifestyle and have the resources in my community that allow me to live? Um, and so we're looking at not only um, investing in projects where some of those amenities can be realized, where maybe the first floor space is used for a grocery store um, or the first floor space is used for some community use, but also locating affordable housing in areas where those amenities already exist. Our first investment for the Housing Equity Fund was in Ar when Crystal City in Arlington. It's an 825 unit community called Crystal House. It is near the Costco, it's near Pentagon City Mall, it is in walking distance to Whole Foods. There are a number of different restaurants in the area. It's near two different metro stops. So locating affordability in areas where you already have all of those amenities and resources that families need to be able to not only survive, but thrive in our community. Woo, okay, yes ma'am, <laughs> yes ma'am. Uh, let, let, let's make it plain, let's make it plain. Yeah. Right. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and bring it home. I think another thing that's important, and I'd be re a bit remiss not to bring it up, uh, having the pleasure to have you on this wonderful show, uh, what you've gone through you know, as a black woman in this space, I think that's super important. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. So I started out my career at age 24 working for a white shoe law firm. Um, I was definitely the, I'm trying to think back, I think I was the only African American in my, my starting class. There may have been a handful of African American partners. Um, and I grew accustomed to being um, the only person of color or the only African American in the room. However, I had the pleasure of working for clients where a lot of the leads were females. They were very strong females in their space, whether that was in private equity or in real estate deals. And I came up at a time where, yes, there may not have been a lot of diversity. Yes, there may have been, um, it may have been a male dominated industry, but honestly, people were so welcoming of having somebody who was different in a different perspective. It didn't mean that it was easy. I had to find a lot of my opportunities outside of work because those who have worked at a corporate law firm know it's sometimes hard to get those billable hours <laughs> in your law firm. I got a lot of experience serving on the DC Historic Preservation Review Board. I was welcome for my different perspective. Um, at the time, Mayor Fenty was actually um, launching a historic homeowner grant program in historic Anacostia and put millions of dollars in home improvements for residents of historic Anacostia. You could literally see the entire neighborhood get a facelift. 
the fact that I was on the DC Historic Preservation Review Board and could really help the staff work through some of the, not only the cultural issues, but some of the legal and logistical issues associated with work, running a program like that was huge. And so I quickly learned, yes, you may be different. <laughs> yes, sure. it may be a male dominated industry, but your presence and what you have to say and what you have to contribute really does mean something. And so I've really focused not necessarily on what I'd lack, <laughs> but focused on the resources and the talents and the skills and the relationships that I do bring to the table and found that that actually really connected a lot of dots for folks that weren't always connected. Um, you know, I, I am a product of the R&B <laughs> Um, uh, time. So our first big, you know, event at St. Elizabeth's was Broccoli City. Like, it was like, yeah, I ahead. didn't steer too far from what I know, what I, I love, and it worked. Um, and so part of it is being bold enough to be different in the room, but then also bold enough to embrace who you are and bring those true resources that truly reflect who you are to the table. All right. So then now look, now I think that was big. I felt it. If you were going to give like a, a inside tip to a young sister, you know, about to in, embark in this boldness you're talking about, <laughs> was there any like, you know, you look back and you're talking to your oh, 24 yeah. year old self, just like, just a couple jewels, a couple nuggets. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I would love um, <laughs> you share some nuggets. So oh, some sweet nuggets. I have some lessons, some hard earned lessons. The first one is stay curious. Stay inquisitive, learn as much as you can. The best advice that I got when I joined the DC Historic Preservation Review Board was keep your head low and do the work. Um, and that really gave me an opportunity to not have to worry about putting on airs, not having to worry about being a politician on a board, but really focusing on learning the craft, understanding what all the different dynamics were. The other one is like, don't embrace your own differences. Like, honestly, most of the time people love the fact that you're different and it's us that carry insecurities about it. And you got to figure out the safe space to keep yourself going, um, but embrace your own differences. Because what you'll find is that even if people don't immediately appreciate it, they will come back around. And last thing, just have fun. Stay true to your values. Like part of the magic that I feel like I've been able to help share is um, staying true to my values. I tend not to to deviate too far um, and it's worked. And so in an industry like the real estate industry or community development industry, if inclusion is really important to you, then drive inclusion. <laughs> if having the arts and culture scene reflected in your work is really important to you, allow that to be your signature. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. You're thank amazing, you. dynamic, wonderful. <laughs> and uh, with that, we're going to let him go. And I always close out with saying I am because we are. And I definitely am who I am because of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Likewise. Thank, thank you, you Sinclair. Thank you. All right. Help protect us from racism and xenophobia by becoming an I Love Black People ambassador today. Join on ilovebeblackpeople.com. No matter where you are in the world, join us today and get access to the I Love Black People Network. Special thanks to Banneker Communities.